Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the academic convocation of the U.S. Naval War College. We are pleased to welcome a total of 530 students from our armed services, civilian employees of the federal government, and military officers from around the globe. Please rise for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for our national anthem and the invocation. Commander Robert Nelson, Chaplain, Naval Leadership and Ethics Center, will deliver the invocation. Let us pray. Let us pray. Almighty God, we now humbly ask for your presence among us as we call together the faculty, staff, and students to rekindle anew the forges in this crucible known as the U.S. Naval War College. Our unique institution is the oldest of its kind, a preparation ground dedicated to the art and craft of warfare, whose graduates have been some of the finest strategic thinkers and leaders our world has ever known. This year, 530 men and women from various countries, militaries, and public responsibilities have answered their nation's call to submit themselves to the refining fire of the challenges and academic demands necessary to make them their best. Each one of them is a servant, having pledged their lives in service to the higher call of their nation and their people, and here they will be made better, stronger, and more capable. Their competence is already a matter of record. Every single person in this room has earned the privilege to be here, a privilege very few others can claim. We look forward to seeing their skills and abilities of each brought together with others, connected to become something stronger, the whole of which is greater than the sum of the parts. But most importantly, Father, we anticipate the refinement of their character, their moral being, which when exposed to the stresses of strategic leadership and the dynamic pace of current combat, must be strong and resilient. O oh Lord, most of all, we pray their time here at the War College would strengthen their inner being so they are prepared to be the leaders our world needs. If there will be justice, liberty, and peace in this world, if war will be prevented, O oh God, it will be because you have prepared men and women like these who presently stand in this room with their heads bowed before you to seek the good in every challenge they face, to face it with courage, with confidence, with honor, and with each other. And it is to that end that we desire your presence among us this morning and always. Amen. Please be seated. 
On the stage this morning are Captain Scott M. Smith, Chairman, Chair, Joint Military Operations Department, Dr. John Maurer, Strategy and Policy Department, Dr. Derek Reveron, Chair, National Security Affairs Department, Grandma Retired, Margaret Klein, Dean, College of Leadership and Ethics, Professor Walt Wilderman, Dean, College of Distance Education, Professor Thomas Clora, Dean, Center for Naval Warfare Studies, Professor Thomas Mangold, Dean of International Programs and Maritime Security Cooperation, Dr. Phil Hahn, Dean of Academics, Dr. Lewis Duncan, Provost, United States Naval War College, Vice Admiral Bruce E. Grooms, U U.S. Navy, retired, Rear Admiral Shoshana S. Chatfield, President of the United States Naval War College. Will members of the Naval Command College and College of Naval Warfare please rise? Everybody in the senior class. <laughs> if you're an 05 or 06, please stand. I know this stuff's new. Captain Kevin McGowan, Director, Naval Command College, will present the 55 nations represented. The Naval Command College, Class of 2020. Algeria, Argentina, Australia, Bahamas, Bangladesh, Brazil, Bulgaria, Cameroon, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Denmark, Ecuador, Egypt, Estonia, Finland, France, Gabon, Germany, Ghana, Greece, Haiti, India, Indonesia, Israel, Italy, Jamaica, Japan, Jordan, Kenya, Korea, Kuwait, Lebanon, Lithuania, Malaysia, Mexico, Morocco, New Zealand, Nigeria, Norway, Oman, Peru, Philippines, Poland, Romania, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Spain, Sri Lanka, Taiwan, Tunisia, Ukraine, United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom, United States of America. They will be joined in class by members of our College of Naval Warfare, which includes students from the United States Air Force, Air National Guard, Army, Army National Guard, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, Navy, and civilians representing civilian or Central Intelligence Agency, Defense Contract Management Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency, Defense Logistics Agency, Defense Senior Leadership Development Program, Department of the U.S. Army, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, National Nuclear Security Administration, Naval Criminal Investi Investigative Service, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, U.S. Agency for International Development, and the U.S. Department of State. Please be seated. Now, will members of the Naval Staff College and College of Naval Command and Staff please rise? Captain Michael Marston, Director, Naval Staff College, will present the 60 nations represented. Naval Staff College, Class of 2020, Albania, Algeria, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Benin, Brazil, Bulgaria, Cameroon, Cape Verde, Colombia, Cote d'Ivoire, Colombia, Djibouti, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Egypt, Ghana, Guyana, Haiti, India, Indonesia, Israel, Italy, Jamaica, Japan, Jordan, Kenya, Korea, Kuwait, Latvia, Lithuania, Madagascar, Malaysia, Mexico, Morocco, Namibia, Netherlands, Nigeria, Norway, Oman, Philippines, Poland, Romania, St. Vincent and Grenadines, Sao Tome and Principe, Saudi Arabia, Senegal, Singapore, Spain, Sri Lanka, Sweden, Taiwan, Tanzania, Togo, Tunisia, Ukraine, United Arab Emirates, United States of America, Uruguay, Vietnam. They will be joined in class by members of our College of Naval Command and Staff, which includes students from the United States Air Force, Air National Guard, Army, 
Army National Guard, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, Navy, and civilians representing Central Intelligence Agency, Defense Contract Management Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency, Department of the U.S. Army, Maritime Administration, Military Sea Lift Command, National Criminal Investigative Service, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, U.S. Department of State, U.S. Special Operations Command. Please be seated. On October 6th, 1884, Secretary of the Navy William E. Chandler signed General Order 325, which began by stating, A college is hereby established for an advanced course of professional study for naval officers to be known as the Naval War College. The principal building on Coasters Harbor Island, Newport, Rhode Island, will be assigned to its use and is hereby transferred with the surrounding structures and the grounds immediately adjacent to the custody and control of the Bureau of Navigation for that purpose. The college will be under the immediate charge of an officer of the Navy, not below the grade of commander, to be known as the president of the Naval War College. He will be assisted in the performance of his duties by a faculty. A course of instruction embracing the higher branches of professional study will be arranged by a board consisting of all members of the faculty and including the president who will be the presiding officer of the board. The course of instruction will be open to all officers above the grade of Naval Cadet. Commodore Stephen B. Luce has been assigned to duty as president of the college. Madam President, faculty, staff, officers, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to speak to you today and one that I highly appreciate. If you would permit me, I would like to say something about the aims and objects of this college. Although called a college, this institution differs from all other seats of learning. A moment's consideration will show why this must be so. As its name implies, the principal object of the college is the study of the science and art of war. Now, war is a very large and comprehensive subject. It would be the height of presumption on the part of the college to undertake to teach officers of mature years any branch whatever of their profession, even the most elementary. All that the college can do, all that it professes to do, is to invite officers to come to it and to offer them every facility for pursuing the study of the highest branches of their profession. All here, faculty and class alike, occupy the same plane without distinction of age, rank, or assumption of superior attainments. All are pursuing one and the same end, the advancement of their profession. We speak habitually of the science and art of war. As a science, it recognizes certain general principles, which are just as applicable today as they were in the time of the great Athenian admiral Themistocles. A strict adherence to those principles has not always ensured victory, it is true. But a violation of them, either through ignorance or neglect, has almost invariably led to defeat. Military writers have been careful to warn us that although war, in its most extended sense, may be called a science, yet it is not an exact science. As an art, war is governed by rules with vary from age to age, 
art, as has been well said, may be learned, but it cannot be taught. This is particularly true of the art of war. It cannot be taught, excepting insofar as one may teach oneself. And it is to offer every officer the opportunity of teaching himself that the college doors are open. That war is the best school of war is one of those dangerous and delusive sayings that contain just enough truth to secure currency. He who waits for war to learn his profession often acquired his knowledge at a frightful cost of human life. Change, continual unremitting change is the law of the universe. Stagnation means atrophy and death. It is not enough for us to keep abreast of the times. This college must be in the very front rank of the advance guard of progress. To obtain some perception, however dim, of the future, we must study the past. This teaches us that the civilization we now enjoy was brought about by war. The proud position we as a nation now occupy was rendered possible only by wars. And future problems in the destiny of man will be worked out through the instrumentality of the sword. There is no escaping it. We are no apologists for war. Heaven forbid. We simply regard it from a common sense point of view. As one of the many evils flesh is heir to. War is a dreadful scourge, we all admit. It is a relic of barbarism. We admit everything that can be said against war, but after all has been said, no student of history, however superficial, can deny that through that same dreadful scourge, ultimate good has been brought about. It has been so in the past, and as far as human discernment can go, it must be so in the future. However, war may in certain instances be averted. But mark this well. It may be averted in one way and one way only. And that way is to be fully prepared for it. That is the meaning of this college. It is an instrumentality for the prevention of war by being prepared for it. To be prepared for war is the role of the naval strategist. To be in the right place at the right time and with adequate force means success by checkmating your adversary without firing a shot. And by simply using skillful strategic movements. It is the business of this college to study all the various problems of war as they may affect this country. It's quite unnecessary to explain to such an audience as I have the honor of addressing that the college itself has no power whatever to act, nor authority to formulate naval policy. Its aim is simply to invite officers to meet together to discuss questions pertaining to the highest branches of their profession and to enable each one according to his or her own inclinations to prepare themselves for the highest and most responsible duties that can devolve upon a naval officer. One thing must be borne in mind. At the firing of the first gun proclaiming war, the so-called inspiration of genius may be trusted only when it is the result of long and careful study and reflection. If attendance here will serve in any degree to broaden an officer's views, extend their mental horizons on national and international question, and give them a just appreciation of the great variety and extent of the requirements of their profession, this college will not have existed in vain. 
Thank you and good day. Thank you, Admiral Luce. Now that we've been inspired by the still relevant remarks delivered in 1903 by our founding president, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our current president, Admiral Shoshana S. Chatfield. It is a pleasure to be here this morning and congratulations to all who were selected to your classes. Under Secretary of the Navy, Modley, Modley, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Slavonic, Vice Admiral Grooms, Vice Admiral Donnelly, Vice Admiral Buck, Brigadier General Bargason, Mr. Deal. Uh, we've got a contingent that have come in from the Pentagon this morning. Uh, so I wanted to uh, point out that we had some distinguished visitors uh, from, a, from away. Uh, to our uh, wonderful distinguished visitors uh, who are here more locally, who have supported this college, uh, welcome. And to our families, our faculty, and most importantly, to the students, welcome to the Naval War College. Thanks for being here for this convocation. We follow this time-honored academic tra tradition of convocation and ceremony to mark the journey that we are embarking on over this next year. We're here today together. We begin this intellectual journey together. And you will go to places you have never been before. You will go outside of your comfort zone and I took note of how many are clustered in your familiar groups. And I project that at the end of this academic year, the seating arrangements would be different as you will become reluctant to part from people you have not yet met and don't know, and you will be enriched by your experience together. There are no limits to what you can do over this next year. So I encourage you to take advantage of this gift of time, the things that in the profession of arms we don't have an opportunity to do, to sit and reflect and to engage in a process of inquiry, a challenging of our own ideas and beliefs, and the time to invest in innovation at the margins. Each of us arrived here in Newport at the same point in time, but through very many different paths. My own path dropped my husband David and I off here uh, on Wednesday evening last week. And we reported in on Thursday. Uh, so I'm in the same boat as you, uh, any of one who is still waiting for your move to happen. And I assure you that I have been placed in my rightful position right behind you in line <laughs> to schedule my own move-in date. So uh, I just love to look out over a group like this and see the variety of uh, nationalities and the variety of uniforms, uh, the wonderful faculty that we have and all of the different experiences that you bring. This is gonna be a great year. Together we represent 76 countries from around the world as well as the states and overseas territories of this great nation. We take pride in the fact that the professional culture, the religious and ethnic diversity of this convocation is unmatched on most campuses. And while we are diverse, unique, and eclectic, we are also alike in many ways. We aspire to a greater good to a sense of right and to ideals of freedom. From this diversity will arise your class, one entity, a class of scholars with common goals and common purpose.
Over this next year, you will be asked to contribute your most valuable commodity, your time, your intellectual energy, and your voice. Here is where you will learn to influence the future, be it through policy or strategy or operations. Here is where you meet the great challenges which will fall to these free nations represented in this auditorium. Once again, it is your time and your responsibility to pick up this gauntlet. You can, and you will, have a substantial impact on the world in which we live. The influence of sea power on today's global commons and commerce goes beyond anything Alfred Thayer Mahan could have imagined when he helmed this institution. Today's distributed battle space would send Clausewitz back to the drawing board. Information warfare today outpaces on orders of magnitude the world of Sun Tzu. But the creative problem solving and strategic thinking that these strategists personified is more important than ever. Therefore, we will not only prepare you for the future by looking at the future, but also by looking at the past. In a perfect world, one might assert that the quest for peace should be absolute. And so we will lend our voices to it over the year through the study of deterrence, diplomacy, advocacy, reassurance, and even hope. But we do not live in a perfect world. And so we must not forget the word war in our institution's name. As such, we study war in all of its facets and in all of its many domains, and not just naval, as one might infer from another word in our institution's name. As the Navy's home of thought, we educate and develop competent and ethical leaders. We support combat readiness. We strengthen global maritime partnerships. We help define the future of our service branch and contribute original strategy and legal research to the national, to the national and international community. While the Naval War College has a significant place in the history, it is up to each of us in this room to ensure it remains relevant to our nation and the world in the future. As we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the landings at Normandy and Saipan this year, places where David and I have recently been and which have affected our viewpoint profoundly, let us not forget that both of those operations were part of a larger effort to defeat threats to universal values, and that both were part of far larger strategic plans to continue to take the fight to the enemy until victory. The Naval War College graduates of the 1920s and 30s helped us win that victory. But even in the midst of fighting, they also planned for the peace that they knew would come. They established the post-World War II era of stability in which we live still today. Will we be ready for the challenge awaiting us tomorrow? Will like-minded nations represented in this room be ready to answer the call? Will that call mean an all-out war in which nations, economies, and industry are fully mobilized with just one goal, victory? Perhaps, would it be a pattern of limited regional conflicts that will challenge all of our assumptions about deterrence and stability? Either way, we must be prepared. It is up to you the future alumni of the Naval War College, to write those papers, to author those strategies, to innovate those tactics. Your foresight will be honed through the study of history here, the, the study of strategy here, the study of policy and operational art here, and the study of diplomacy here. 
all of those are framed through the optics of leadership and ethics. I hope that throughout your studies, you will not neglect the study of war termination. Once we achieve a costly victory, we must create the peaceful era that follows. There will be no second chance. It is imperative at the conclusion of hostilities to get it right. And to that end, we must leverage the best and brightest men and women from all backgrounds across the globe. In these past 20 years, we have learned that the inclusion of women in peace and security is more likely to produce stability in outcomes and stability that endures. What other lessons will we learn about the conduct of warfare and war termination? What do we have left to learn? How will we ethically bound our use of space and cyber, new technologies? Over the next year, you will grow stronger, smarter, and you will be reinvigorated for your tasks and challenges ahead, but I assure you, you won't want to leave. Learn and take with you the knowledge that you get here. Benefit from the century of study relevant to the challenges that you will face in the world. And when you walk across the stage at graduation next year, I am certain that you will be ready to lead. So now, as the 57th president of the United States Naval War College, it is my distinct honor and duty to declare the 2019 and 2020 academic year officially in session. The president of the U.S. Naval War College takes pleasure in presenting the certificate to Vice Admiral Bruce E. Grooms, U.S. Navy retired. If you could take the uh, stage, Admiral Grooms. In recognition of his exceptional service to the nation, the Department of Defense, and to the U.S. Naval War College, he is hereby designated as the year 2019 recipient of the Distinguished Graduate Leadership Award. This award recognizes Admiral Grooms' unparalleled dedication to duty, unwavering sense of personal and professional integrity, and insatiable intellectual curiosity. These traits, which form the bedrock upon which, which the U.S. Naval War College was established more than a century ago, has been instrumental in enabling this distinguished graduate to set a standard of ec excellence, which all future graduates should strive to achieve. Awarded, awarded the fifth day of August 2019, signed Shoshana S. Chatfield, Rear Admiral U.S. Navy, President U.S. Naval War College. So we're going to bring uh, Vice Admiral Grooms up in just a moment. I'd like to take a moment to introduce him to you. Uh, this is the 24th time that the Naval War College has presented its Distinguished Graduate Leadership Award. The award was first presented in 1996, and it recognizes the accomplishments of our most distinguished graduates. Uh, they relied on the lessons that they learned in their Naval War College experience as they assumed positions of increasing senior leadership and national prominence. And those alumni serve as an inspirational uh, role model for each of us. Um, and thank you, Vice Admiral Grooms, for being here today. That first award, was actually to the late General John Shalikashvili. Then he was Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. A complete list of other awardees is in your program. And so, um, for Vice Admiral Grooms, a 35-year veteran of the United States Navy and Submarine Force, his career culminated as Deputy Chief of Staff for capability development at the NATO Allied Command Transformation from 2013 to 2015. The totality of his career is 
further detailed, and I'm just gonna um, kind of brag on the United States Naval War College for just a moment. Uh, in the Van Buren uh, Leadership and Ethics Series, Naval War College alumnus Lieutenant Commander Robert Crosby authored a paper uh, called Inspiring Innovation, examining the operational policy and technical contributions made by Vice Admiral Samuel L. Gravely Jr. and his successors. And it caught my eye because my husband David's father, a Naval Academy graduate, had worked directly for Admiral Gravely. Uh, and so I pulled down this a wonderful publication and I became aware of the fantastic research that had been done. And there's an addendum, sir, with each of your awards uh, located uh, online. You can access it through your Google engine and you can access it here uh, on the digital space. So, um, sir, your career has been just so inspiring and your impact on the Navy has been truly tremendous. Uh, you've since moved to the civilian sector, uh, serving as Raytheon's Vice President of the U.S. Business Development for Navy Programs from uh, 2015 until this past June. And now uh, you've recently been named a Corporate direct Director at MCOR. Uh, congratulations on that. Uh, they're a leading provider of advanced mixed signal optics uh, that products that provide the foundation for today's leading edge defense systems and high-speed communication network infrastructure, uh, which is a mouthful, but I'm sure uh, absolutely um, motivational every day when you get up to see what's going on uh, in that organization. Um, so for now 39 years, you have supported our nation, first in uniform and now ensuring that the health of our economic institutions and corporations are uh, solid and firm as we move towards the future. Uh, Vice Admiral Grooms, thank you for being here, and would you please um, take the podium and uh, share with us your thoughts. Wow. Well, good morning, everyone. What a beautiful New England day. And what an honor and a privilege to be here, to be amongst you, and to celebrate this convocation. Admiral Chatfield, thank you for those very kind remarks, very kind introduction. So often you kind of wonder, is she talking about me? <laughs> but I thank you so much for that kind introduction and for the award, the Distinguished Graduate Award. When I look at the Folks who preceded me, I think to myself, I'm not sure I belong in this, in the company of these folks. I'm so honored to be included. It's been a very long time since Emily and I have been to Newport. I've had the pleasure of coming back frequently, but this is the first time in many, many years that um, Emily's been here with me. Now, I have to tell you, as we were doing the run-up to this event, um, I was talking to the staff and asking sort of how this would go, and they said, hey, this is a really quiet, cozy event. You and the president will chat, a few of your very best friends, the student body, and the distinguished staff. Well, little did I know that things changed in a hurry. And so, we have this group of very distinguished Navy leaders who are here. And so, uh, although Admiral Chatfield has mentioned them already, I'd like to just say first, I'm not foolish enough to think that they came here to see me. <laughs> uh, I know the reality is that they are here because they support the War College they support everything it stands for. This place of higher learning is so important to each of us. I, I think I learned how important this was as I spent time getting to know the folks here. And so uh, thank you all for coming. So to Secretary Modley, Assistant Secretary Slavonic, my dear friend, uh, Admiral Buck, who recently relieved as the... Uh, superintendent of the Naval Academy. Um, of course, I look down and I see 
Uh, my hero from many, many, many years, Admiral Hogg, so good to see you here, sir. Um, and you're looking great, by the way. Um, my dear friend in the submarine force, Jay Donnelly, uh, dear classmate from the War College back in 93, Admiral Bundy, and somewhere out there, there's a Naval Academy classmate, company mate, roommate, Dr. J. Hickey, who's here as well. And so that's really kind of neat. Uh, the fact that we have four Chiefs of Navy, International Chiefs of Navy, I find that amazing. I hope that each and every one of you will take advantage of the opportunity to get to know them and to learn from them. Uh, Admiral Verma from India, Admiral Barrera from Colombia, Admiral Saunez from Norway, and I think Admiral Takai as well. It's amazing to have them as a part of this august group. And I, I have to say that I'm very proud to have been in the same class as Admiral Barrera many years ago, and then off he went to do some amazing things uh, and challenging things in uh, Colombia. Now, before I give my very brief remarks, and soon it's going to be difficult to say they're brief if I don't get on with it, <laughs> but I, I do have to say that um, it's so good to see Secretary Modley here. Um, he and I have a very special bond. Uh, we both were born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, went to the Naval Academy together. Served some time in the Navy. He went off and did some really amazing things in business. But I have to credit him for something uh, very special. He, um, he single-handedly um, twisted the second nav's arm and was able to get a ship named after our great city of Cleveland, Ohio. And so there will be a ship, uh, the USS Cleveland, a literal combat ship, and it'll be commissioned sometime soon, and so that's really neat. But that's not really the important part of uh, the good secretary. As it turns out, he and I are really huge Cleveland Indians, Cleveland Cavaliers, and uh, Cleveland Browns fans. And so as it turns out, um, the good secretary, you, know, you may not know, the Cleveland Browns are one of only two NFL teams in the original NFL to not have made the Super Bowl. <laughs> one of two. Detroit will never make it, but <laughs> Cleveland is. And so he has promised that the, uh, the Browns are going to make it to the Super Bowl this year and I heard him say, uh, as a side note, and they're going to spank the Patriots. <laughs> so stand by, everyone. Uh, I look forward to sharing in that glory with you, my dear friend. And uh, go Browns. Now, back to what's, <laughs> what's really important here. So, so I recognize the importance of the convocation, the welcoming of each of you to the academic year, the chance to broaden your experiences, to get to know folks. And so, so I have two really simple things that I intended to do today. One was to reflect on my time here, and then the second is, I'm a sailor, so I have to tell a sea story, and so I will do that. So in, in words of reflection, it was more than 25 years ago that my dear wife, Emily, and I came to the War College. Um, as fate would have it, I was at sea on deployment, getting ready to come, and Emily was taking care of all the details. Uh, and sure enough, we received our orders about a week before we were to head to Newport. Um, my dear, beloved, and petite wife gave birth to our very first child. And so that little rascal must have weighed 100 pounds. <laughs> and here was Emily 
trying to make all of that work, we hopped in the car with the little guy and off we came to Newport and we joined the family, we joined the community. We spent lots of time learning and reading. Frankly, um, I may be pretty good at academics, but I quickly learned I was a lousy babysitter. And so Emily made sure I, I learned that. But you know, amazingly enough, it took a very short amount of time before she enrolled us in ballroom dancing classes. We had our little guy in a poncho and we're dancing around doing the waltz and the two-step. We became part of the War College community and made so many friends. And it was just a wonderful experience. We certainly figured out how to balance the responsibilities of learning. But for all of you, the perspective is please make sure you figure out that balance because now is the time to get to know each other, to share, share perspectives, but also to have fun. We spent weekends going to Boston and to New York City, and so it really rounded out as a wonderful year. The second thing I remember about the, uh, the War College was that, well, for the first 10 to 12 years of my military career, I thought the world revolved around submarines. I thought the whole Navy, you name it, was all about submarines. And then I arrived here, and it took a whopping day or two for me to figure out that, wow, there are such amazing and bright aviators. Some may think that's an oxymoron. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Lots of important aviators here. There were these aviators, these surface warriors, the Coast Guard, the, you name it, the other services. And so I learned quickly the world didn't revolve about anything that I had done in the past. This was such a broadening and enlightening experience. And frankly, I have friends that I made while I was here that I met along the way and rekindled those friendships at so many other places, and especially the joint and international jobs. It was amazing that I would go someplace, rekindle a friendship, and it would turn out that we were mutually supportive. And that's what this War College is all about. Learn, share perspectives, get to know folks, and you'll find how important that is. As a matter of fact, after I left the Navy and went off to work in defense industry, I run into an Army guy, and we worked together, who I had known in the service, and it was from the experience we had previously that brought us together and made that job in uniform so pleasurable. So finally, to my one C story, and this is true. As now, <laughs> I'm required to embellish a little bit for the sake of giving a, a lesson I hope you will take away from from this. But, but this is a, actually a Naval Academy experience, but it has sort of the same, hopefully the same lesson you'll take away. So an international friend of mine, a very dear international friend of mine, won a contest on a local radio station. And the contest was simply this. They had this huge, whatever, 10,000 series Mercedes-Benz, they filled it with soda cans, and to win the contest, you had to guess how many cans of soda fit in that um, huge Mercedes-Benz. And so, of course, each of us all figured we were smarter and better, and we were going to make our guess, and we were going to win that little devil, and then we'd keep our fingers crossed. So we dutifully paid the dollar or two to... Uh, Enter the contest, we came up with our gonculator and figured out what uh, number we thought would be, and we entered the contest. Well, a few weeks later, my dear friend, the international friend, won the contest. And, and I hate to say this, but uh, of all the folks, all the smart folks that I knew, uh, I said, he's probably not the guy I would have picked to win that contest. But as it turns out, and, and so here's, here's the lesson. We corralled him after the event, 
and, and after he was driving around in his beautiful car, <laughs> and said, how the heck did you win that contest? And so he said, well, it was simple. So one weekend, I went out and rented the same car, <laughs> and then went to the local mart and got a whole bunch of cans of soda, filled up the car, counted them up, and then I figured what might be the delta. So he made 50 entries plus or minus one, two, three, four. He paid the 50 bucks. And lo and behold, he won the contest. And so uh, this was, you know, back then, this was, I don't know, $60,000, $70,000 car. So he said, I really don't need this. So he sold it to the dealership for $50,000. And then he said, and it cost me about 2500 to get all the soda cans and rent the car, so you do the math. <laughs> it was a very good day for my friend. But what's the lesson here? What's the lesson for all of you? So we all come to a place like this. It's very selective, so you're very, you should be very proud that you're here and we're selected to be uh, a student at the War College. And we all think we're the smartest folks on the planet, which some of you are. But the international folks, it was as selective for them to come here as well. And so lo and behold, here's this guy who was smarter, more capable, more savvy, and at the end of it, had a whole lot more money than the rest of us. <laughs> and so I suggest to you that even though you know, there may be some language barriers, whatever it is, the other folks that you don't know in this room, get to know them, learn them, understand, share perspectives, because I guarantee they're as smart as capable. And frankly, many of those here will become the leaders of their services. And there's a very good chance that some of you in here may end up saving world peace by your engagement with some of the international folks that you meet here. So to each and every one of you, congratulations for being here. Uh, we welcome you with open arms as a part of the War College family, and you'll always be a part of the War College family. And again, thank you for this great honor of this Distinguished Graduate Award, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as I can. Thank you very much. Please rise for the benediction. Let us pray. Eternal Father, throughout history it has been the tradition of seafaring peoples to ask your blessing before setting sail on a new endeavor or to fulfill a new commission or to explore or to defend or to engage their enemies in combat on the high seas. And so now, O oh Lord, we ask the same for these students and for the faculty and staff who will help them navigate the uncertain waters they will sail and for the family and friends that will support them. O oh Father, King of earth and sea, we dedicate this class to thee. In faith we send them on their way. In faith to thee we humbly pray. O oh, hear from heaven our fervent cry, and watch and guard them from on high. Amen. Please remain standing for the departure of the official party.